those ideas and see what we can do with it. So. And in upcoming events, uh, on September 14th, which is a week from this Saturday, uh, is at the Kenosha Civil War uh, History Museum. Uh, they have their annual Great Lakes Civil War Forum. And it's on Mr. Lincoln's Navy. And I've been to a number of these forums. They are excellent. And I, and I encourage you, if you have a chance to go, go. Because they have really four speakers. And this year it's about Lincoln's Navy. They have four different speakers that will be talking about that. And it's excellent. Uh, there is a registration fee. It includes lunch. And on top of that, usually around September 14th is a beautiful time in Wisconsin. The museum is actually right on the lakefront in Kenosha, so it's actually a beautiful area. And if nothing else, just go because it's just a beautiful area. So anyway, I encourage you to do that. And uh, you know, I think that information went out with our last meeting notification, how you can register for that. But I encourage you to do that. And the, uh, the director of the museum, uh, Doug Dahman, he's actually spoken to this group a couple of years ago. He does an excellent job there at the museum. Um, preserving really Civil War history from the five state perspective of, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and I forget the other, other state, Just, dare I say Minnesota or Iowa, no, I don't know. <laughs> Indiana, okay. Um, and then next month, our speaker will be uh, talking about Frank Lloyd Wright's Monona Terrace, the Enduring Power of the Civic Vision. And this is actually a connection that Bill Sales made with our presenter on this. So if you're, you're kind of interested in some of the insights of, of the Monona Terrace and kind of following through on Frank Lloyd's Wright's vision of that, uh, please come out and, and attend and find out more about that. Uh, so let's go through the schedule really quick. I'll pull that up here. So we have our schedule filled out through January, and then, uh, then we end up in May. Uh, so tonight, again, we have Dave Marinus, and then next month we have Dave, David Mullenhoff uh, talking about the uh, Monona Terrace. In November, at our November meeting, we have uh, a retired teacher and author. She'll be talking about the farm and badger keep memories of the Midwest girlhood. And in December, we have Chris Kolakowski from the Wisconsin Vets Museum is going to be talking about the battle for Okinawa. So, Chris, you can raise your hand and dig. So, Chris will be here in December. And uh, also, we're thankful that, if you remember, for those who were able to attend last December, he gave us a tour of the archives built, uh, for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, which was, was very interesting. So, and I think uh, a number of us really, really appreciated that tour. So, we're looking forward to Chris's presentation in December. Now as we go to January, um, this kind of interesting topic, this came up actually a couple years ago, and now we finally, <laughs> we kind of finally got it booked, is uh, Don Mahoney is going to be talking about the history of telegraphy with a working, an actual working display. So I encourage you to come up for that. And, uh, they'll learn more about that. So it promises to be very interesting. And I know, Bill, you're working on, I believe, a lady who is a, oh, she's even here. Maybe I shouldn't say anything. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, a Vietnam veteran, a nurse, I believe, with uh, the, the Navy Department, is that correct? Yeah. So, I, yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't want to steal the thunder. But... <laughs> anyway, I believe we have to book a date, but I, I hopefully we can work out something in one of these couple of months. So um, look forward to that. And again, if you have other ideas for for speakers, we do have those those couple dates open for this year. And then last of all, in May, um, I'm going to do a presentation about a person called Andrew Jackson Bovey and the Battle of the Wilderness. And uh, it's actually my great-grandfather on my mother's side. And he actually fought in the wilderness. He didn't fight very long. He was wounded on the first day, shot through the ankle. He 
did recuperate. I think he went into like an invalid regiment, uh, but then he was honorably discharged um, after Appomattox. So, kind of learned about the little history of him because I found out my relatives and my mother's side were all from the Twin Cities area. I found out that he farmed and logged about five miles where I grew up in in Anago, Wisconsin. I thought I never and I never knew that. So anyway, so we're going to talk a little bit about him, his interesting life, his engagement in the Battle of the Wilderness, and then we'll actually talk about the battle itself a little bit. And actually, how I kind of got interested in this is through a person by Pete Holocaust. And it was actually so. Raise your hand. You you can do that. And uh, it was actually at the last December meeting, and I think somehow we got talking about you know, Civil War, ancestors and stuff. And I, I, told, I told you that I was taking a trip with my wife up the southeast coastline, starting at St. Augustine, and ending up in Central Virginia. And my wife's not here tonight, but she will tell you that she was tortured by attending every single fort on the southeast coastline between those two areas. Actually, she enjoyed it by the end. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, Pete says, we well, get to get a hold of these guys from the field, you know, the Friends of the Wilderness Battlefield. So I did. When I was in Central Virginia, I, I got on their site, left a message, and about a day later, the guy says, let us know, I'll give you a tour. And that kind of all started off about this whole research into my, uh, my great-grandfather. So anyway, I hope you can attend that at the end of the year. Okay. That said, I think I've taken care of all the logistics. Anything else I might have missed? By this time, nobody cares. Okay. <laughs> anyway, now I want to introduce our speaker for the evening. His name is David Marinus, and uh, I think I first learned about David when he wrote his book about Lombardi. And I remember back in the year 2000, I said, "This is, this sounds like a really good book <laughs> because you know I grew up in and it was like 90 miles west of Green Bay during the Lombardi years. How can you not like a book like?" You know, so anyway, I got the book and said, man, this is a great book. And anyway, a couple years ago, Bill says, you know, we should try to get Dave Maris. We're originally thinking, you know, like, let's have him talk about Jim Thorpe, because you had just written a book on, on Jim Thorpe. And I thought, that'd be kind of cool. But anyway, we are even more honored this evening to have David uh, present his book, uh, They Marched into Sunlight, War and Peace, Vietnam and America, October 1967. And uh, David is a very well-renowned author, journalist. We'll go into all his credentials. He's also presenting at uh, the Capital uh, Times Idea Fest. And uh, so anyway, let's give a big round of applause and a, a warm welcome to David. Mark. Thank you, Rich. Uh, I heard that this was originally the Civil War Roundtable, and that takes me back to my childhood. Because, uh, I grew up with the Capital Times, and John Patrick Hunter was kind of the Civil War Roundtable guy. And he was a great friend of our families. Uh, I have to confess that I was sitting there uh, eating some tater tots, and a high school friend, classmate of mine, came by, Mary Top. And I said, what are you doing here? You know, you've already heard this rap. Um, and she said, no, I haven't. And I thought I was going to talk about Thorpe. Uh, because I'm giving another speech this week that's about Thorpe. So luckily, thank you, Mary, you saved me. And I, I'm happy to talk about the march into sunlight. As a matter of fact, um, you know, I'm quite involved with the Capital Times Idea Fest, which has an incredible lineup uh, starting next Sunday. Uh, but uh, Nancy Pelosi, Liz Cheney, Judy Collins, Doris Kurtz Goodwin, um, Heather Cox Richardson. It's just amazing the people that are coming. I'm going to do several of those, moderate several of those conversations. Um, but on next Sunday um, at the Wisconsin State Historical Society, uh, the Idea Fest is opening uh, with an event that deals with this book. Um, after this book came out, 
a friend of mine who's a great choreographer in New York City, Robin Becker, called me and said, this was in 2003, right when the Iraq war was going on. She said, David, I want to do a dance that deals with the issues of war and peace. Um, and I just read your book, and it's phenomenal, and I want to make a dance out of this. So she did, um, and I'll tell you more about that later. But then, several years after that, a great documentarian came to us and said, I want to do a documentary about how in the world you can turn a, a book into a dance. And he did, and that documentary, the film is phenomenal, and that's what we're going to show next Sunday night um, at the State Historical Society, along with Robin, the choreographer, and the filmmaker will be there with me to talk about it. Um, but I, I heard that there was a Vietnam nurse here tonight. Thank you. And um, all Vietnam vets are invited for free to come to the event, so I'd love it if, if you're interested on Sunday. Um, and I'll get your name and make sure that you can you can go, okay? And any other Vietnam vets, if there are any here, um, we're making a special effort to get them to come to this. Uh, one of the heroes of this book uh, is a uh, well, he's, he's gone now, but. He was a lieutenant in the battle, and I'll get, talk more about him later, but um, after the dance was uh, made, he, I invited him up to Washington to come to Georgetown University to watch the dance uh, be performed for the first time. And he's a crusty old former Green Beret. He said, you know, David, come on, modern dance and war? And he's, he was very dubious. Um, halfway through the the dance, he was in tears. And watching him after the dance go up on the stage with all these beautiful young dancers who surrounded him um, was one of the most moving uh, scenes I, I've ever experienced in my, my career. Um, this book is 21 years old, came out in 2003. I've written uh, nine books since then, so. Luckily, because I'm going to be talking about this book again in the next, uh, twice in the next month, I've sort of refreshed my memory about it all. I don't want to end up talking about Clementi or Lombardi or Obama or something. Um, but of all the books that I've written, this one, even more than the one about my, well, it's sort of tied with the one I wrote about my father and the Red Scare. And, all that my family endured during that era. Um, but this one had an enormous psychological impact on me. Um, it's really, you know, I, I immersed myself in the lives of men who endured the worst that mankind could do, could do to one another um, for several years as I was researching this book. And then for many, many years after, all the way through now, um, so, you know, I, I, didn't, I don't think I suffered from PTSD, but it certainly had such a profound psychological effect. Um, but mostly for the better. And I'll explain that uh, a little later. Um, this book was born out of the fact that I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1949. Um, I went through the Stations of the Cross of that generation with civil rights and Vietnam. And as I, as I was writing two of my earlier books, uh, the biography of Vince Lombardi, who probably still mattered, and the biography of Bill Clinton, um, first in his class, in both of those books, about two incredibly different person characters. You can't imagine two people on different perspectives, more so than Lombardi and Clinton, in most respects. Um, but as I was researching those books, Whenever I got to the 1960s, which were crucial for both of them, Lombardi was, that was the glory years of the old Packers. Um, with Clinton, that was the years of, Viet of how he dealt with Vietnam and civil rights and, and Waterloo, um, all of that in the 70s. Um, whenever I came to that era, I slowed down because it meant so much to me. I mean, I, you know, I could connect to that era so deeply that I thought, 
Well, I should write a book just about Vietnam, if that means that much to me. Um, I was a freshman at the University of Wisconsin in 1967. That fall, I was wearing my first blue jean jacket, um, and I was in the crowd watching as the Dow chemical protest unfolded in front of me. Um, I was even then sort of more of an observer than a participant because I'm just naturally a reporter. That's what I do. I observe life. Um, and so I saw as the cops came in, the Madison police, 30 of them, the leader called themselves the Dirty 30 and gathered under the Carillon Tower and marched into the Commerce Building. And I watched as students came out with bloody heads. So that was a, a, it was the first protest on a college campus that turned into a violent incident. And I thought I should start there for a lot of reasons. It's 1967. You know, people would say later, well, why didn't you do the Army Beth Research Center bombing in 1970? That's not interesting in the same way because everything had been settled by 1970. In the fall of 1967, life was changing every week. Rapid. You didn't know what was going to happen. It was after the summer of love, before the Tet Offensive. You didn't know what was going to happen in this country, in, in Vietnam. Everything was up in the air. So that's a point of drama that I'm always looking for in my books. So I said, I'll start with that protest. But that's not really what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was bring the war and the anti-war together into one seamless narrative. There, I was giving a speech at the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, speaking of the Monona Terrace, to this group of like 500 people, and I had one of those microphones on us that was already attached to the stand, and halfway through the speech, the microphone disappeared into the stand. <laughs> <laughs> Another time I was giving a speech at the Madison Club and I spilled some water. So, I mean, all wars are horrible. Iraq, Afghanistan. But if 60 people had been killed in either of those wars, it would have been a huge front page story and gone on for weeks. But in Vietnam, 
There was so much death and destruction that 60 was just another day, sadly. Um, the reason it became a story is because of two famous people. One was the battalion commander, Terry Gila Mesa Allen Jr., who was the son of a famous World War II general, Terrible Terry Allen. And the other was a major, Donald Hollander, who was an All-American football player at West Point. And when I saw Hollander, it rang a bell because he had been recruited to West Point by Vince Lombardi, who was an assistant coach at West Point in the early 1950s. And in all of these boxes of archival material that I had for the Lombardi book, I had a prayer card that Lombardi had kept for Donald Hollander. So when I saw that name again, I thought, well, this is meant to be. I've got to do this story. Terry Allen, Jr., when he was killed, was kind of a classic case of the Deer Johns that happened in Vietnam. A few months before the battle, he got several letters from his wife back in El Paso saying that she was turning against the war, she didn't want to be the wife of a military officer anymore. And so he came home to try to save his marriage on emergency leave. And while he was there, he had three young daughters. The oldest was not quite six. And she told me as I was researching the book that when her dad came home, on the last day that he was there, she hid under a table like this, thinking that if he didn't find her, he wouldn't go back. And then when he did find her, he said, Daddy, don't go. I know you're going to get killed. And of course, he went back. Donald Hollander, the All-American football player, was in a helicopter over the battle. And he heard what was unfolding below, ordered the helicopter to land and rushed down a ravine to get to the, the jungle where the battle was taking place and was shot down by a sniper, one bullet killed him. He was running just like he ran as a football player. He was, he was an all-American end, but he was so much of a leader that Red Blake, who had been the coach at West Point in that era, turned him into the quarterback for his senior year. He couldn't throw a lick. You know, for old football fans, he threw like Bobby Douglas in the Bears. You know, it wasn't a spiral. He, he couldn't throw at all. But he ran like a wild Mustang. And that's what he was doing, running down that ravine, just like the football player when he got killed. Those two people are the reason that this was even a story. 1967, the fall of 67, General William Westmoreland was the commanding officer in Vietnam. And he was arguing with, well, he was trying to persuade Lyndon Johnson that they could win the war simply through battles of attrition, just like General Grant in the Civil War. Just go out, find the enemy, fix them in place, and kill them. That was the whole strategy of the war at that point. They were, at that point, they were going on 400,000 men in Vietnam going, and he wanted another 100 or 200,000 more. So the whole pressure in that period was, let's get more men there, we can win it just by finding the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese, fixing their place and killing them. That was what was going on for the Black Lions Battalion, which I write about in this book. They were based in Lai Kê, about 30 miles northwest of Saigon on the way towards Cambodia. And from there they went out on these search and destroy missions in what was called the Long Min Secret Zone. And on the morning of October 17th, they're clanging around in the jungle and they walk into a three-sided ambush. Unwittingly, 
They didn't know what was out there. Um, and it turns out that what was out there was an entire regiment of Viet Cong, the first infantry of the Viet Cong, 1,200 men, 140 men walking into a three-sided ambush, 120 men. The night before the battle, Clark Welch, who was a, one of the two company commanders, he was then only a lieutenant, but he was such a good leader that they made him a company commander. He was trying to talk Terry Allen out of making a direct line into where they thought maybe there were some Viet Cong. But Terry Allen was feeling the pressure from above, from LBJ through Westmoreland, to the, first, the commanding general of the 1st Infantry Division, General Hay, all the way down to Terry Allen, to just go out. You're not gonna lose, just, if you lose some men, fine, but we're gonna kill the Viet Cong. That's what we're doing now. Um, so he didn't listen to Clark Walsh, and they walked into this horrible ambush. There were Viet Cong, set of claymore lines everywhere, they were tied in the trees. The Viet Cong commander was just sitting there waiting for them. He ordered the, his scouts to click on a piece of wood three times, and that's when they would start firing and hold their fire until then. Another one of those sort of incredible little things of life. The, so, the lead sergeant of the first platoon was going out was a black guy named Johnson. And his favorite song was Eddie Floyd's Knock on Wood. He was seeing that as they're walking into this ambush and the Viet Cong are knocking on wood to kill him. After, it turns out, and I'll get to this, um, you know, getting the real story from the from the soldiers um, was became easier because this was in the early 2000, 2001, 2002, and the internet was starting to really connect Vietnam vets in a way that nothing had before. They were, you know, most of them had gone home and not talked about it, or they talked about it once in a while to someone else who had endured it, but then. Through the internet, they were reconnecting, holding reunions, talking more about it. So I found, out of the 60 plus who were still alive, I found all of them, except for Clark Welch, who wouldn't talk to me, because he was one of the company commit, company leaders. He had fought valiantly that day, but he was afraid because he'd lost so many men that some Loved some mother or sister or daughter would say, you're responsible for the death of my loved one. So he was hiding up in the hills of Colorado. And finally, after I'd spent a year and a half interviewing all of the other soldiers who survived the battle, he agreed to meet with me. Um, we agreed to meet, he was in Colorado Springs up in the mountains. We met at a hotel in Denver. Unbeknownst to me, he got there early and scouted me out like a green beret before he decided whether he talked to me or not. I was a clueless reporter. Um, so he sat down and he said, David, I'll talk to you if you promise to be good to my boys. He said, I can't make that promise. If I make that promise, it'll end up that I'm either violating the truth or I'm violating my promise to you, one or the other. It just doesn't work that way. And he got up from the table, he said, that's not good enough, you gotta promise to be good to my boys. I repeated what I'd said. And I said, look, I will, I promise that I will tell you everything that I'm finding, that I'll search for the truth, but again, I can't make that promise to be good to your boys, I have to be promise that I'll be good to the truth, whatever it shows. And the second time he listened and he decided to trust me and that made all the difference. So that by the end of 
our time together, he agreed to give me 60 letters that he sent home to his wife, which would weave through the book and, and make it so much richer in terms of what he was thinking of doing and was building up this company before the tragedy of Babel. And then, as I'm finishing my reporting, I planned a trip to Vietnam. This was in the late winter of 2001, or no, 2002, January into February, right around the Tet period of Tet. And that trip, you know, one, one of the reasons I love what I do is because there's so many moments in it for all of my books where I just feel lucky that I'm there at that place at that time to see history compress and the, the meaning of what I'm researching take on this extra vibrancy. And going to Vietnam with Clark Welch, with the oldest daughter of, of of Terry Allen, the killed company commander, Consuelo Allen, with my wife and a few other people, um, was unforgettable. I went with a couple of missions. One is I wanted to go to the battlefield. You know, my motto of all my books is go there, wherever there is. That started with Lombardi, where I turned to Lynn to my wife right after the 96 election in November and uttered the immortal loving words, how would you like to move to Green Bay for the winter? <laughs> <laughs> to which she responded, Burr. Uh, but we did and it made that story so much deeper, but I've been making, up, making it up to her ever since. Puerto Rico for Clemente, Rome for Rome 1960, uh, Hawaii and Kenya and, and uh, Indonesia for Obama. Um, and then Vietnam for this book. Um, so I came there because I wanted to see the battlefield, I had to go there. And also I wanted to find the Viet Cong in that battle. I was lucky in that, that well, maybe lucky is the wrong word, but the two, there were two MIAs from the Black Lions Battalion in that battle. And MIAs became a huge deal, so much so that the government's you know, spent enormous energy trying to find out who they were, where they were, what happened to them. So looking through all the MIA documents, it included these two guys and much more detail about the Viet Cong regiment that fought in that battle. So when I got to Vietnam, I had a handler, Madame Ha, who was luckily from the South, so she wasn't as rigid as some of the northern handlers were. But I gave her the name of the company commander, Bowman Trett. Wasn't expecting much. After two days there, she, she called and said, David, we got your guy. Um, he lives in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. He's in charge of population control in Ward 13. And he can come to the offices tomorrow and you can talk to him. So he did. Um, and Clark Welch came with me to this. We're sitting across the table a little wider than that. Clark and I on one side, both in tread, and a Vietnamese interpreter on the other side. We had, I had a great American interpreter who was incredibly fluent in Vietnamese on our side. And the truth is that I was so afraid that Vo Minh Trep wouldn't remember the battle because he'd fought for years in Vietnam. And, you know, battles are chaos and they're seen differently from different sides. So I spent two hours or so just talking to him about his life, how he'd grown up in the South, went to the North after the French left, came back down through the Ho Chi Minh Trail early in 1960. Two, um, and was leading this Viet Cong regiment and, and told me his whole life story. Clark is getting sort of anxious sitting next to me. Come on, David, get to the point here. And so finally I took out this map that showed the long wind secret zone in great detail. And Vomin Tret, who was 
about five foot one, had a starch white shirt and a Vietnamese uh, bolo tie with insignia on it. Horn glasses. He got up from the seat and pointed exactly where the battle took place. There's no markings there. He said, we weren't supposed to be there. Let me tell you what happened. Turned out that they were starving. They were out of food. They'd been eating stinkweed for a week or two. And they knew that there was a rear group near there that had rice stores, stores of rice. So that's why we're, they were there. They weren't supposed to be there. They were supposed to be up closer to the Cambodian border where they'd gotten directions that there was going to be a real battle up there the following week. But they're there eating, getting rice, and there's this heavy American battalion climbing through the woods, so they set up this ambush. That's how it happened. After this horrible battle, where 60 men were killed, including Terry Allen and Hollander, the survivors, including Clark Welch and the others, were taken to a, a, a hospital further south. And two days after they were there, General Westmoreland comes to visit them. And he, you know, first he, he talks to a kid who lied about how old he was. Uh, he was a hero of the battle. He was only 17. He lied about his age to get in. Then he comes to a sergeant and says, what happened, Sergeant Barrow? And Barrow says, sir, we got ambushed. We got the shit kicked out of us. And Westmoreland said, no, you didn't get ambushed. You can't get ambushed. He said, and Barrow said, well, I don't know about you, but I know I was there. We got ambushed. Westmoreland didn't want to acknowledge that the American military had these search and destroy missions that this could happen to them. And so the military made up a body count and said that they'd won this battle. And I found an oral historian, a uh, really smart African-American major, sent up there to find out what happened in the battle, largely because Terry Allen was killed in it and his dad was pressuring the government to find out how this happened. So he goes up there and discovers the fraud of the body count. That what had happened was, right after the battle, someone would say, oh, how many dead Viet Cong did you see? And someone would say, 10. How many did you see? 12, 10, 10, 12. They had, they're all the same bodies, and they made it up and added them up to more than 100. So that the official accounts of the battle said that uh, you know even though there was Many casualties for the Americans, they won the battle and defeated the Vietnam, which is completely a lie. And the truth is that the soldiers who endured that knew it was a lie and were angry about it for the rest of their lives until I came along and wrote the book. When they knew the truth was out there and nobody had told them, even, even though they lost, it was the honor of the truth that they were after. And the truth was that it was a horrible ambush that they walked into. Another thing I discovered which really infuriated the soldiers is that the commanding general of the first division, General Hay, who wasn't in the battle, who arrived hours later and chewed everybody out for what had happened. He got a silver star for that battle. Just a phony thing that was happening to get promoted. When I went to Vietnam, after we found Vo Minh Chet, he agreed to come to the battlefield with us. So we piled into this van. It was me and my wife and our interpreter and 
Clark Welch and Betrayal Allen and Lomi Tripp. And C-SPAN was actually there. They were doing a, a documentary on how I researched my book. So it's all on film. And we drove up, got within about a mile of the battlefield, and then the roads ended. So we got out and walked. And as we're walking toward where, we, where the coordinates said the battle took place, there was a farmhouse. And it was run by Wynn Van Long, who it turns out had been in that battle, even part of that rear support group. Volmi Tread is with us. He recognizes Wynn Van Long. They, they hug each other. I haven't seen you in 30 some years. Um, then uh, Volmi Tread, who's in charge of population control, says to Long, How many kids do you have? He says, 10. <laughs> Well, we try to choose him out. He says, no, that's irresponsible, you know. They invite us for lunch of squirrel and snake wine. And I said, no, I'm full. <laughs> um, and then one of Wim Van Lama's sons come, comes in. He's missing a left arm. He'd come in from the Maniac fields. And uh, when Van Lam said that he was working in the field three years earlier in an old U.S. munition that exploded and taken over his arm. He said, you left that here. Then we started to walk from the farmhouse toward where the battle would take place. And it was an incredible scene because Bowman Tratt and Clark Welch, the two commanders who had been trying to kill each other, we're walking almost arm in arm. Um, Tripp didn't know any English. Clark had studied a little bit of Vietnamese. But they were communicating beautifully as two old soldiers. And I had a map of the coordinates. Clark had a uh, GPS pendant around his neck. We walk through the Manioc fields. There's a rubber plantation to our right. Clark says, as I said, we're getting close. Clark said, David, according to my GPS, if we walk 100 yards to the right, that's where the, the heart of the battle was. That's where Terry Allen was killed, not far from where I was with my troops. So we walk into the rubber, through the rubber trees. It's a beautiful early, late winter day, sun dappling down through the leaves, crunching below us. And we get to that spot, and I knew that Clark Welch had been killed as he was trying to hide behind an anthill. And the anthills in Vietnam are not, you know, they're like four feet high. We get there, and there's an anthill. It's a different anthill, but it's the same anthill, in a sense. And it was at that moment, as I looked around at who was there, me, the kid who was against the war, Clark Welch, Vomi Tread, who tried to kill each other all those years ago and we're now together, Consuelo Allen, whose father had died at that very spot. What struck me was not well, first of all, it was the way time compressed, as I said, and I felt everything that I was writing about in that moment. But more than that, what I really felt was the commonality of the human experience, which is really what all of my books are about in the end. Thank you very much. They, they set up um, fire pits with smoldering smoke and abandoned those and lured them in. Um, 
and they walked right into it. Um, and the, the thing to understand is, this is their country. They know every inch of it. The Americans don't. So they knew exactly what they were doing. I just want to thank you, David, for an image you left in my mind. I guess you got all writers trying to do. But the image of a baby great Ethiopian marathoner coming through the gates and in Rome, and you say you heard his, his bare footsteps ahead of anybody else. And that's always stayed with me. I love that image. Thank you. That's another book. <laughs> but, but, but writing about, you know, going to Rome and seeing where a baby ran barefoot, passing the Axum Obelisk, which Mussolini's Italian troops had stolen from Ethiopia, put in Rome. I bet if Akila gets to the obelisk on his route, it takes off from there and just leaves everybody in the dust. Yeah, Doug. Uh, David, it sounds like Trent and Welch might have had a moment. Yeah, they did. They shared, yeah, their soldier. Yes. Um, anything similar for the soldiers who fought the war and the people in Madison and the protests? Are those bridges? Yeah. You know, it's another tragedy of that war that it split America in a way that's still living today. Um, there were some. Uh, Paul Sogden was at that, uh, you know, our future and wanted to be mayor for life. Uh, <laughs> was in the Congress building, was clubbed by the cops, uh, suffered a serious back injury from that. I took him out to Las Vegas uh, for one of the Black Lion reunions. And maybe half of the soldiers embraced him, the other half wanted nothing to do with him. And that's probably about right. And just just like the country was split, so are Vietnam vets, you know? I mean, there are a lot of Vietnam vets who hated that war, fought, came back and opposed it. Not necessarily in the way that the student protesters did, but in their own way. And half was basically say, yeah, it was a bad war, but I really can't talk about it that way because that diminishes why my buddies died. So it was sort of that split there, too. Um, There's one other really odd sort of coupling from those two worlds, which is that um, the late Dave Wagner, who worked for my dad at the Capitol Times, um, covered the Dow protest uh, in 1967. And then he eventually moved to near Phoenix, Arizona, had a son, Ben, who fell in love with a woman who turned out to be the daughter of one of the soldiers in that battle. What are the odds of that? So, you know, just like Clark and William Trett, you know, time can be, I don't really believe in, in the sort of healing. I think it's kind of a false notion. You, you know, those cracks never really heal, but there are, but time does change. I mean, think about today. I mean, a Democratic Party that goes from AOC to Dick Cheney, you know? I mean, <laughs> the world is changing always. Deaths are responsible. 
politicians and generals. Like you, I had the opportunity to visit Vietnam uh, maybe 10 years ago. It was basically we were in Hanoi. I'm sorry? We were in Hanoi. Uh -huh. um, where we were working on it. Uh, yeah. And the people were, you know, I was surprised not that there were that many soldiers. Right. You know, that were still alive, probably most of them were dead. Kids, probably, grandkids. Grandkids, yeah. yeah. Vietnam is the youngest country in the world. So I remember when we went on Ho Chi Minh's tour. Uh huh. Rio, right? Yeah. There was a bunch of, I'd say, first graders, there were probably you know, 100 of them, and they all had to speak English to us. Sure. Well, if any of you have gone to Vietnam, you realize that. The, the American War of Aggression, as they call it, is just a speed bump in their history. Uh, they're, you know, when we went, they loved Clark Welch. Everybody would pitch him and rub his hair. And Clark Welch, my friend. Um, they don't hate Americans. They hate the Chinese and the French. Because the French colonized them and the Chinese wanted to control them. The Americans fought against them and left and lost. So it's a completely different image. I mean, you can go to the museum and see all of that and go to the Hanoi Hilton and check the, all of those. But basically, the people there, they're into a capitalist system in a sense, and they, they love the Americans. So it's, and it's beautiful. Yeah. Hey David, what um, did your work in Vietnam and with the Black Lions and the Vietnam change your view of the anti-war protesters in the town you grew up in? You know, um, I mean, I remained as vehemently against the war as I ever was. Um, it didn't so much, I mean, maybe a little bit, but mostly it just changed my understanding of the soldiers. That was the real impact of the book on me. I grew up here, I knew all the protesters. I was reporting on it or watching it. My dad, who was the editor of the Cap Time, said, Dave, you can do what you want, I just don't want to see your picture in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it would me a little bit. Um, but it was the understanding of the soldiers deeply that really changed the most. I mean, I, there are a lot of people like me, I mean, I, I was already married. When, I, when my number was called, when the, when the uh, lottery happened, I was an asthmatic. I was, I was not going to go anyway, but I didn't have to go. You know, a lot of people in my situation who expressed guilt about that. Um, I think the system was screwed up, but I don't feel guilty. I wasn't going to go anyway. Um, and I didn't believe in the war. Um, I think that a lot of protest is a combination of idealism and self-interest. And the self-interest can be stronger than the idealism for a lot of people or the other way around. I don't like to generalize about that. Um, so I understand that part of it. Um, and that a lot of people were just going, a lot of the protesters were just going with the flow of that moment and not really thinking deeply about what the larger issues were. Um, so there's a lot of superficiality about that. There's also a lot of soldiers who didn't want to be there. And, you know, like I told Clark Welch that I couldn't promise to be good to his boys. They weren't all good, you know? Um, some of them didn't do good things. You know, they cut off the ears of, of Viet Cong. They did a lot of, you know, it wasn't like uh, the worst of Cali and, and that, but it was, you know, they, they didn't do everything the way you're supposed to do it. They're under enormous pressure. Uh, the, when I went to one reunion, the, another image I'll never forget, um, there was a soldier, um, Tom Colburn, who 